Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the vagina and its history, including our knowledge of it and how we have talked about it throughout the past and even today. My guest for this conversation is Rachel E. Gross. Rachel Gross is an award-winning science journalist, former digital science editor of Smithsonian Magazine. She writes for the BBC Future, the New York Times, and Scientific American. She is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about called Vagina Obscura, an Anatomical Voyage. Rachel Gross, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you so much, Mitch. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. Your, your book was, was fantastic. I, I enjoyed spending time with it. And in a moment, I'm really going to ask you about how human society in general approached the vagina in history uh, and sort of the absurdities that we approached it with and, and still sort of ha have hold it on to some of those absurdities. But I actually want to begin with something that I found really fascinating and positive. And this is a quote from your book I'm going to read about the reproductive system. It's this, quote, The ovaries just don't grow egg cells. They pump out a hormone cocktail that maintains the health of virtually every organ system, from heart to bones to brain. The vaginal microbiome, microbiome is an extension of your body's immune system, protecting the liminal space from intruders while helping keep the body's equilibrium in check. The uterus is one part of an intricate body-wide dance, trading in stem cells and immune cells with the blood and bone marrow. Together, these organs make up something larger, a web of rivers and pathways that feed into each other and work together to keep the balance of you. Again, I, I found that fascinating, not, not surprising. I, I didn't realize all that. Um, was this like a journey for you in discovering about all of about all, all that there is to this vital organ that uh, we hardly talk about in a serious way? Yeah, I'm so glad you read that bit. I think that really captures a huge theme that I came to in my journey. Um, I, I, I think coming into this book, I had the idea that I was going to find that a lot of these organs, what we typically call the reproductive organs or the reproductive and sexual organs, were a lot more interesting and complex and dynamic than we typically think of them. But I didn't realize that I would come to view just the idea of reproductive organs as so limiting. So I ended up being so much more interested in what these organs are doing for your body throughout your entire life, whether or not you intend to get pregnant or are pregnant. Um, and I think that's what's been so overlooked by Western medicine and science. The, the role that, that it, the reproductive system for women plays in just overall um, physical health and all the dynamics that, that, we, that I just read through, do, do we find that for men too or, or with, with their um, reproductive systems, with, with their organs, or, 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 or is this specifically for women that we see this kind of dynamic? Um, I think absolutely. Uh, my other big theme is that partially because there's such a big knowledge gap when it comes to the female body and partially because there is so much overlap and because because all bodies share this universal body plan, um, the more we're learning about this terrain, the more we're improving the science of all bodies. And that definitely includes male bodies. So just as an example, um, the penile microbiome is less explored, but we know that it has a role in protection against disease and reproductive health. Um, it's just been less studied even, I believe, than the vaginal microbiome. Um, and studying the origins of something like endometriosis, which is the very common condition where um, cells similar to the lining of the uterus grow outside the uterus, um, it, we're coming to understand that inflammation um, over a long period of time probably plays a big role. And those patterns of inflammation may be important in male reproductive health too, and may cause other conditions that are you know, not the same, but similar or related. So yeah, I would definitely argue that this is all relevant for male bodies. Yeah. You, you also write that we're, we're more, men and women are more alike than different, including, oh, in, yeah. Yeah. Um, I do spend a lot of time talking about these, to me, really remarkable um, overlaps and similarities and just patterns that we all share. So 
I loved learning about um, in embryonic development, you know, like human embryos basically all look exactly the same until at least like eight weeks in the womb. Um, and we all have the same thing between our legs. Um, it's like a little, little bump called a genital tubercle. And we also have two sets of plumbing inside. So what we would call male or female, Mullerian or Wolfian ducts. And um, as the common story goes, like in biology class, one of those sets of ducts will wither away and the other one will take over and you'll become male or female. And that that bump, the tubercle, will become the clitoris or the penis. Um, but really, the, the clitoris or the penis, both the phallus, are coming out of the exact same embryonic tissues. They really are incredibly similar and have all the same erectile tissues and function um, when you become an adult. And um, a fun fact that I learned was that those pairs of ducts or plumbing, they don't go away. You actually end up with these remnants in what we consider the opposite sex. So um, males in the urethra have this thing that's called um, the prostatic utricle, and it's like a tiny underdeveloped uterus thing. Um, and then females have these little bodies hanging off uh, the fallopian tubes, I believe, um, that are remnants of the male system. Uh, so like we each have, you know, parts of the other inside ourselves. Um, and I think we're a lot closer than we think. We share this universal body plan. And, and this is significant in understanding gender-affirming surgeries that happen today. Yeah, so I have a whole chapter on the history of gender affirmation surgery. And the surgeons I spoke to, um, they it was really interesting how they approached it. Some of them kind of felt that all people are um, start off in the womb female just because we're all kind of the same then. Um, but also they have this intimate understanding of all these parallel tissues that all develop from the same embryological structures. And so they know how to manipulate those tissues and use surgical techniques um, to really retain like pleasure function, erectile function when going, for instance, from male to female anatomy. Um, so, uh, one amazing surgeon I speak to actually in the Bay Area, Dr. Marcy Bowers, um, I think she says like uh, that the penis is basically a large clitoris. I don't know why we don't just call it that. Um, so, you know, that might be going farther, um, but she really is attuned to how it's all the same parts, just arranged differently. So when there is a gender affirming surgery going from male to female, there is actually the creation Maybe creation's not the correct term here, but uh, of a of a vagina, though, uh, of a real vagina. Yeah, um, yeah. It's in the medical medicalese. They sometimes call it a neo vagina and a neo clitoris. Um, but I write about how, in the evolution of this surgery, originally there's just a very different kind of um, theory behind it. It was very much kind of created around the idea of heterosexual sex and a heterosexual relationship and ideas of like what a vagina should be. Um, and it meant something very different in the 60s than now. Um, and now surgeons are really working to make it about um, a trans woman's own sexuality and experience of their body and really wanting to have all of all of the characteristics that you would want in your body. Um, it's not about your partner's pleasure and enjoyment. Um, it's about how you feel about this, you know, quote unquote, new body part. I want to ask you about that last chapter in your book. I had planned on asking about it later, but we could we could jump around and just go with the flow of the, the conversation here, because it is a fascinating chapter that gives the history of affirming uh, gender affirming uh, procedures and, and operations, and there is there is a long history to this. This, you know, this is something that's we talk a lot about today. I think in public discourse, but there this, this history goes back quite some time. Right, um, and I guess I just want to say that because of the nature of this book, and it's about like how the female body, in particular, like the like reproductive sexual system, has been conceptualized over time. I do focus on that surgery, but I never want to like. Um, reduce anyone to a certain procedure um, or suggest that for everyone, this is part of their identity or necessary to them. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but I think looking at that history really said a lot about what the medical community 
viewed kind of the vagina and its accompanying organs for and how they really did think of it as part of like um yeah like a heterosexual union so i go back to um johns hopkins and the clinic they started in the 1960s um one of the first um kind of open clinic for the surgery and they were really interesting because they called themselves experimental and they were really looking for um, trans women who were already super feminine and hopefully would get married and like have a family and basically would end up passing. And they thought that would be a success if someone became a super feminine heterosexual woman afterwards. Um, and it, it's really kind of icky today. They had them jump through all these hoops and they really took on very few patients and, um, you know, their techniques were pretty pretty early. So um, it it was just not at all about what you would hope this experience would be today. Um, and I ended up following um, a surgeon who is a trans woman herself, um, Marcy Bowers, and the way that she talked about what she's trying to give people and the experience she wants them to have is remarkably different. It is about like their goals. And she really does consider things like beauty and sensation and orgasm and the clitoris is so central, which in the early days, it was barely an afterthought, if anything. Um, so it really has come a long way. And I think it does say something about how society views and values these body parts. Who, who is Henry Benjamin? Harry Benjamin, um, he was, he was, I guess he was kind of known as the father of um, early transgender medicine. And he really introduced like this community to medicine at large. So he ended up working um, with trans women and he was able to offer them hormones often, but at that time it was almost, it was either illegal or doctors were too afraid to ever try a surgical procedure. And so he really saw how they suffered and um, he saw the success of people who were able to have a full surgical transition who wanted to. So he became really an advocate um, for getting people the medical treatment they needed and for uh, really kind of um, fixing some of the misconceptions in the popular imagination between like cross-dressing and having a transgender identity. Um, so he was pretty instrumental in forming this like bridge um, between the trans community and the medical community. And this preceded what was happening at John Hopkins University, right? Yeah, I mean, he was involved in the Johns Hopkins part um, by in that he funneled patients in, um, but his career in this lasted a long time. It's kind of the second half of his career. And then there were the mayhem laws. What were, what were those? Yeah. Um, so I believe um, historian Susan Stryker goes into this in her really wonderful book on transgender history. Um, but there were these statutes that were from way back in England that said you cannot remove like a part of the body that someone needs. Um, it's illegal. And apparently they were put in place because there were young men who were removing like a finger in order to get out of being conscripted into the military. And so some version of these statutes still existed in America in the mid 1900s. And there was a fear among doctors that if they did this surgery, it would count um, as violating the mayhem statute and they could like possibly be sued or they could be sued for something else. So there was a lot of fear and anxiety around it. And it was interesting once John Hopkins and again, it's not the same kind of attitude towards it in the, in the 1960s that, that you, you would see later on. This evolves with, with time. Um, but once John Hopkins started doing these surgeries, there was a huge demand for them. Yeah. I mean, they found that thousands and thousands of people were applying, but they were not helping them all because they're intention was not to help as many people as possible. It was to try an experimental surgery and get data about whether it worked or not by their standards. Um, and it ended up that a lot of other universities ended up opening clinics and in response to how much demand there was. And eventually those would be replaced by the private surgeons, which was mostly what we have today, or surgeons attached to a hospital. 
And again, there's just so much stigma put on this, but the reality is, and you write about this in the history that you tell, there's been stigma on genitalia and specifically uh, female genitalia going back through ancient times. You write about Hippocrates. This is where we get the, the term Hippocratic Oath, who deemed both male and female genitalia as meaning, quote, shame parts. And then you write that the study of sexuality, in other words, was tinged in shame from the beginning, but it was women to whom the shame stuck. Yeah, so um, Hippocrates did use the same Greek word for the male and female genitalia. Mm. That means the shame parts. A ahead of um, his time, I guess, in the sense of using the same <laughs> word. Unfortunately, or set the stage for the future. Um, so that was striking to me, but what was more striking was that this pattern kept repeating. So every time a usually male anatomist discovered a female body part, for instance, the clitoris, they would name it something that had the word shame in it. So there was um, a French surgeon who announced he discovered the clitoris in the 1500s, and he also named it like the shame part in French. Um, and then today you have like in German, Schamlippen is the vulva or the labia, and that means shame lips. Um, and pudendum, which is a kind of um, technical medical term, but is still in all sorts of gyneco gynecology textbooks today, um, that means the part for which you should be ashamed. So, and when I said that it was women to whom the shame stuck, um, like, I think there's a lot of shame and stigma around genitals in general, but I was particularly talking about words like that. Those were the ones that ended up being applied to female genitalia, even if they started out as both. It is interesting. The German word still does mean shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in a lot of other languages, too. Yeah. And what, what, what's the consequence of this? I think it's both a reflection, more of a reflection of how we've been taught to view our bodies and of some of the relationships between people interacting with the medical system. I think um, there's lots of great surveys that show that women and people with vaginas are embarrassed or reluctant to talk about a lot of sexual condition, conditions like infections um, or pudendal neuralgia, which is a very painful pelvic condition um, because they have this built-in shame around these parts and, or they feel like they can't talk to their doctor about it. There's not this openness. So in the one sense, you could say this is semantics and we don't even use most of this language. Um, and like, how can you prove what effect it has? But again, I think I'm looking at the bigger pattern and at the dozens and dozens of patients I talk to who continually describe these conditions as causing them shame and their reluctance to talk openly about it. And I think that prevents everyone from getting the health care they need. Yeah. And also the shame of it is, is sort of skewed our, our knowledge of it as well and, and deemed what was important to investigate and, and learn about and what, what was not. Absolutely. Um, I think the the really strong patterns I found was that an over-focus on reproduction and fertility skewed the kind of knowledge that we have. And then, like you're saying, this shame and stigma about what was okay to talk about in research and what was not, um, that also stunted research in many, in many fields. I'd like to go back. You mentioned this earlier, a condition known as endometriosis. 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 Yeah. Thank you. And that you could can you you might be able to connect it this this condition to the 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 historic use of the word hysteria. Right. Um, this is a little bit of a winding journey, but um, many of us are familiar with like the general concept of hysteria. Um, it originally referred to a medical condition um, in Greek times of having a wandering womb. So it was thought to be a really like biological condition. So if you're a woman and you have stayed, quote, barren too long, um, you haven't got married, had enough sex or had kids, then your uterus was going to wander around your body um, searching for sex and motherhood. And that could cause really bad effects and possibly pain and cramps and fainting. Um, so this idea persisted for a long time, um, and there were many steps in between 
But ultimately, uh, Sigmund Freud, who pops up quite a lot in this book, more than I would like, um, he kind of detaches the idea of hysteria from the uterus at all. And he says both men and women have hysteria. And it's not that there's a physical problem going on. It's that your physical symptoms are coming from a psychological problem and you should go to a therapist like me to fix it. Um, and once you fix this like conflict in your mind, then the physical symptoms will go away. Um, and I think what's ironic is that fast forward to today, um, hysteria was only taken out of the DSM like in 1980. So it was an actual diagnosis for a very long time. Um, and it's really chronic pain conditions that more women have that are much more often diagnosed as psychosomatic, as something that's all in your head, as something that you should get antidepressants for or see a therapist. I've spoken with so many women who along their journey to get their endo diagnosis um, were initially just told to see a therapist and take antidepressants. So there's still this, this disconnect um, and this dismissal of real physical pain um, that does have to do with the history of hysteria. Yeah, it's all in your head. It's, it's all in your mind. I, I think the, I think a lot of people will relate to hearing that. I think about growing up, my mom always had internal pains. It was not endometriosis because I actually called her yesterday to find out if that's what it was. But she, oh, wow. she, had, she had scar tissue issues uh, growing inside. And they always told her it was just in her head. It's just in her mind until they finally opened her up and then they found what was going on. Oh my God. Um, there's such a long history of dismissing women's pain and not just women, but it's just remarkable to me how many people I talked to that were told that. And basically once the doctor agreed to do that kind of diagnostic test or open them up, which can be traumatic, um, they've immediately found biological evidence. So it's not that we can't find biomarkers for most of these diseases. It's that we haven't been prioritizing it or trying. Um, and endometriosis is a really good example because there are a lot of efforts right now to find a diagnostic marker so that you don't have to have surgery in order to be told that you have this chronic pain disease that you should be getting treatment for so it doesn't continue growing. Um, and there are probably really easy ways to do it. I know researchers looking at menstrual blood um, as kind of this natural biopsy um, that you could find markers of inflammation in. But when they first tried to, to try this out as a tool, gynecologists said like, oh God, no, none of my patients will give their menstrual blood. That's disgusting. So there's all these biases and attitudes that are blocking really important science from getting done. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Rachel E. Gross. Rachel E. Gross, award-winning science journalist. And we're in conversation about her book, Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage. I, I, this is off the top of my head. I forgot to write it down, but, but I think I remember reading that even the government didn't start taking research into women's reproductive, reproductive systems until really recent. I think the NIH began with its program in, in what, 2014 or somewhere around then? Good memory. Um, yeah, so there's always been a lot of research into fertility and infertility, but the first actual branch, like gynecological branch that studies like uteruses, ovaries, and vulva is kind of in their own right and not just during pregnancy, that was 2014. Um, and the crazy thing is it's still under the Umbrella Institute, um, the Institute for Child Health and Development which again suggests that these organs are important in so much as they're relevant to having a baby for reproduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were told in researching this, that Congress only cares about, about the uterus if there's a baby in it. Yeah. Yeah. A researcher did tell me that. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, Freud comes up in your story much more than, than you wish uh, he did. Tell, tell me about the significance of, of Sigmund Freud. Yeah. Um, so I just didn't expect him to be so relevant to the history of gynecology and medicine um, because, you know, he's known as the father of psychoanalysis. He's problematic in a variety of ways. Um, and he just didn't have any training whatsoever on the female body. Like he had training as a neurologist and he looked at like the brains of crayfish, but 
he had no no place to be talking about this stuff and and yet uh, his theories, um, including most notoriously his theory of the, quote, vaginal orgasm, huge scare quotes, um, and then clitoral orgasm, uh, they really stayed with us and stayed in medicine for centuries almost. So even today, I talk to surgeons who do gynecological surgeries, and they referred to women, um, these were, this was a French surgeon, um, as either vaginal or clitoridian, as in like separating women who had different types of orgasms. And like we now know and have known for more than 60 years that that's biologically untrue and there's no anatomical evidence for that and that there's no such thing as a vaginal orgasm essentially. And yet like those ideas have still just been very sticky. Um, and so I did feel that I had to address Freud's influence. I think that it ended up harming millions of women and creating these kind of binary frameworks that prevented a lot of progress into sexual anatomy. How, how much is this at least holding on to these debunked ideas for so long? How, how much do you think that is also because the health field was so dominated like all fields most fields anyways by 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 men uh yeah i mean definitely that is absolutely a pattern and not just medicine but um anatomy earlier on um and even to some extent biology and evolutionary biology which i get into um basically what i saw is that at a certain point um somebody comes into the field who has a really different background um, which can mean a lot of different things. And they start asking questions that no one else has thought of. And these questions are often quite obvious, but, you know, everyone comes with their own lens and their own bias to the table. And so if you have all one type of people, um, in this case, like often white men, you're going to be asking certain types of questions and you're just never going to see that there are really interesting, important questions to ask. So that is definitely something I saw. It's not like I can say that all these researchers were men with the same ideas, but I did see, for instance, in the vagina chapter where I actually uh, turn over to other non-human animals, um, there's a Colombian biologist, um, Dr. Patty Brownin, who realizes that nobody has asked about duck genitalia and nobody has bothered to see what duck vaginas look like because they assume that it was like a simple tube and it's not exciting and it's not interesting. And she found that it was a very complex labyrinth that had these dead ends and like pouches and really had a lot of um, importance for what happened to a certain male duck sperm um, and whether or not she gave birth to his children. Um, so, uh, I literally like male scientists that she talked to and asked, like, had you ever looked at this? They said, no, I just never thought to. I kind of just assumed the female looked like this. And it's those kind of e easy assumptions um, and lack of curiosity that have really, I think, um, stifled a lot of the science. How, how, how similar are different species vaginas? Extremely different. There's like a huge variety. Um, so, Patty actually went on to really kind of, she would, she would call it like unlocking the copulatory black box of animal genitals. So she's looked at snakes, alpacas, bats, um, and she's found like parallels. So she kind of specializes in sexual conflict. And so she finds a lot of animals that have these kind of spiraling or labyrinth vaginas that actually make it more difficult for the male to inseminate. And that includes ducks and also like whales and dolphins. Um, and so she and her colleague, Dara Orbach, were looking at um, dolphin vaginas. And um, I'd often heard, like, you can tell a beetle by its penis. You can tell the exact species if you just see the penis. But Dara was the first person who told me, like, actually, I can tell exactly what species of whale this is just by its vagina. It has, like, a certain amount of folds. It spirals this way. It's kind of like this one is more complicated and has more ridges. So it's just that we, I think, have tended to look at this as negative space or as something passive and not worth looking at more deeply. And they used, like, pretty common sense techniques. They actually use dental latex to make molds of the vagina and pull them out. Um, but that kind of renders it as a positive three-dimensional space. And then you can really appreciate 
all the complexity. That's interesting. I, I do want to come back to Freud, not for Freud's sake, but for somebody else who he was he had a relationship with, and, and I don't think this is a romantic relationship, uh, but this is an important person in your book uh, by the name of Marie Bonaparte. And this would be I, the niece or the great niece of, of uh, <laughs> great grandniece of, of uh, Napoleon uh, yes. Bonaparte. Tell me, tell me about Marie Bonaparte. Yeah, so Marie is kind of the, she's in the opening chapter on the clitoris. And I just found her entire story completely fascinating. Um, she was a noblewoman. She grew up in interwar France. Um, or rather, she became an adult in interwar France, and she had always wanted to be a doctor, but her father said, like, no, it's not appropriate for someone of her stature. She needed to marry rich. She eventually did and became the princess of Greece and Denmark. Um, and then, like, later on, after having kids and being in her 40s, she got really obsessed with um, with psychoanalysis, and she wanted to use it to figure out these sexual problems she was having. She had issues with her relationships and she never managed to have what at the time she thought was the normal type of orgasm. So uh, quote, mature vaginal orgasm. And meanwhile, Freud is writing these papers saying that um, when women are infantile and children, they have clitoral orgasms. And when they become true mature women, they transfer their orgasm to the vagina. So, you know, this mystified a lot of people, but Marie Bonaparte actually decided to do something about it. And because she was like wealthy and privileged and well-connected, she was able to actually meet Freud, um, actually take um, psychoanalysis with him and become his pupil. And she would eventually come to basically challenge his theory and say, um, actually, like, Sometimes it's, there's not a psychological problem to overcome. There's no way of doing this transfer that you talk about. Sometimes it's just about your anatomy. Um, and she actually interviewed hundreds of women in their gynecology appointments and like took genital measurements and had, came up with her own ideas about um, how likely it is to orgasm this way, depending on like where your clitoris is located. Uh, and then she went a little off the rails and she ended up developing a surgery to move her clitoris closer to her vagina so she could experience this type of sexual experience she thought she was supposed to. And that is both like really like remarkable. She's like this original biohacker um, and like, wow, like what a radical solution. And then it's also really sad um, that the norms of her time told her that her body was not okay as it was and that she had to do something like that to be acceptable or to feel like a proper woman. Um, so she's, she's a very complex character. Um, she is definitely very flawed, um, but she is this strain of Freud's life that like I had never known about before. And then he, and she was incredibly influential. Like she saved him from the Holocaust. He was buried in a Grecian urn she gave him. They were really besties, I would say. Yeah, they had a very, they're very tight, close, relationship right. did did how how did and this is when freud's much older yes um, yeah. he's having his jaw removed right and we can because of it yeah so he had um he had a, a lot of cancer on his jaw um maybe from smoking all those years and he was just in a very bad place when he first met marie um he had just lost his granddaughter to spanish flu and he just didn't feel like he had much of a will to live um and he didn't even want to see marie he wasn't wanting to take on new patients but once he agreed to and she was this like sparkling dynamic extremely learned woman who spoke many languages like her letters to him switched between french and german and english which makes them very hard for someone trying to read the archives um and she was just a breath of life for him. So he would say like she really rejuvenated him and that um, he would end up like doing like two hours of analysis a day with her, which was unheard of. What was his view of, of, of her surgery? What, what, what happened with her surgery? Yeah, so she developed the surgery with, um, with a prominent surgeon at the time, an Austrian surgeon, I believe. And um, they actually published about it in medical journals, and she underwent it herself, and Freud was very unhappy with this. Um, so 
he definitely disapproved, um, thought that she was being super reckless. And, you know, he's the guy who literally said anatomy is destiny. And here she was saying, actually, I think I can change my anatomy. I'm not destined to this. Um, so she wanted him to visit her um, when she was recovering and he would refuse and like express his displeasure, which made her really, really upset because he was really this father figure to her as well. Um, and, you know, eventually they reconciled, he came back, but it definitely continued to be a major rift um, between them in their in their theories because she became a psychoanalyst of her own um, and she continued to kind of espouse on her theories and embroider upon them and they continued to diverge from his um, but he really respected her on female sexuality um, she's also the person that um, that it is reported he wrote the letter to with the famous words what does a woman want um, she was the one he asked earlier not, not too long ago, you, you expressed um, lament, I suppose, that Marie Bonaparte lived in a time in which she couldn't be accepted and feel acceptance and feel comfortable uh, with her body as it was. And immediately I thought when you said that, I made a connection to another person that you write about in your book, really in the afterword of your book, by the name of Beau Laurent um, can you tell me who, who Bo Laurent is? This is somebody who actually reached out to you. Yeah, Bo is remarkable and like I consider her a friend and she's, um, wow, like I can't wait for her to write her book. Um, so Bo is kind of like the founder of the first intersex society and movement in America. And um, I actually... I learned about her work and about intersex rights at Berkeley and like one of my gender studies classes, but it was always kind of presented as something very theoretical. Um, so fast forward, um, I made a educational video about the clitoris um, for Scientific American a couple of years ago, and Bo saw it and reached out to me. And she wanted me to know that there are like a whole other community of people for whom this anatomy is relevant. Cause I had talked about gender affirmation surgeries. I'd also talked about um, genital cutting and surgeons who have developed a procedure that is supposed to um, try to reverse some of that. And she said, actually there's a type of this like cutting happening all over the U S and it's happening on intersex infants. Um, and it was a very, like sobering and striking email to read. And we struck up a con, a, conversation, a correspondence. Um, and I just began like realizing who she was and kind of putting together the pieces of having come across her in my reading and in that class and then hearing her personal story. Um, so she was one of those infants um, who basically when you're born, doctors decide whether you're a female or male. And that sounds very easy, but for up to 2% of people, um, actually, like, it's not like every box fits in what you think of as the male or female, like, diagram. Um, it's a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap. Um, there are, you know, women born with testicles, and there are men born with penises that, um, that medicine wouldn't consider to be big enough. Um, and the same with women. Um, so it's, it's very common to have like a clitoris that's larger than the usual. And in that case, um, for a very long time, doctors would remove most of that. Um, and in a way that ended up being scarring both emotionally and physically for those kids when they grew up. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really dark history in America and it's not over yet. Um, there's been a lot of hospitals that have announced that they'll no longer do these surgeries in the past couple of years, but it's still absolutely being fought and a lot of um, kind of laws that have been tried to be passed to prevent this have not made it. Um, so it's a debate that's ongoing. Um, but Bo really became a strong advocate and uh, she just, she, knows both the anatomy and science and medical side and the activist side um, and the patient side. And she really is this like wealth of information about that history. Bo Laurent was also known as Cheryl Chase. Uh, that was 
that was a former name of hers. Yes. Yeah. When and, and that's I mean that was was it as Cheryl Chase when when she sort of became known as yeah like that's um, intersex so activist. I guess that would be the name on a lot of her academic writings. And when she founded ISNA, the first intersex organization, um, and yeah, um, her name is Bo. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea is just let people be as they are, as as they're born. Oh my gosh, yeah. So one reason that the intersex community I felt was so important in this book, um, and I really, it only crystallized for me later, but this is a group of people who have been kind of the most drastically affected by our notions of maleness and femaleness and what is a woman and what is a man. Um, and in our efforts to make those dividing lines and put people into boxes, they are some of the people who have been the most hurt and in a way that's not in any way theoretical or academic. Um, so uh, yeah, I ended up speaking to a lot of intersex individuals and I really hope to expand on that either in the next version of the book or in a feature. Um, I think they taught me a lot. And the one refrain I heard a lot is that culture, the society around them tells them that their bodies are what's broken and need to be fixed. And what they're saying is actually society is broken. Fix that, like not our bodies. And I think that sums it up really well. I suspect a lot you had to take on issues of, I don't know, it would be appropriate to say nature versus nurture or society versus biology. What our expectations of gender means historically, what they have meant and what the result of that has been. Yeah, I mean, I definitely had to work it out in my own head how not to conflate um, anatomy with gender identity. And that really, like, I, I think writing this book really showed me that often they have very little to do with each other. Like, I've met every type of woman and person possible. And, like, it's very easy to know if they're a woman, just ask um, or let them tell you who they are. And it often has nothing to do with their genitals. And yet genitals are so central to identity, either um, because we've internalized ideas about them or because society tells us that they matter so much. Do you see your, your book as, as part of an effort to change the story of the vagina? Yeah. I hope so. Absolutely. I think it's kind of like half of it is showing where we've been and how limited the lens has been through which we've looked at these parts. And the other half that was really important to me was centering these often like women explorers and scientists who are reframing these organs. And that's kind of to give a glimpse of like another way of looking at this and what like amazing science can be uncovered when we have new people on the scene. Um, and you know, it'd be my dream if like young people considering science or medicine could look at this and say like, oh, this person literally makes a living looking at animal vaginas and mapping them. Like I could do that. Or, you know, like some of the more, uh, the more like improving medical treatment for everyone. Um, I think there are some examples of really remarkable people that are doing this work. And that's what makes the book hopeful to me. Tell me about Miriam Mencken. Uh, Miriam Mankin is one of the historical female scientists in the book, and she actually was a researcher affiliated with Harvard in the 1940s who performed the first, um, like, in vitro fertilization, essentially the first, like, combining sperm and egg so that they made one cell um, in 1944 during World War II. And she was very, very little known about um she didn't get much credit and it wasn't until the seventies that we had like IVF really come to fruition and had quote test tube babies. Um, so I came across her archives at the Harvard center for the history of medicine. Um, she worked under Dr. Rock who developed the contraception pill among other things. And basically no one had really told her story extensively. There were just like a couple shorter papers on her, but um, she fought so many odds in order to be in that lab doing that work. And she wasn't able to get a PhD, probably a lot because of her gender. Um, at the time, medical schools were not taking women in general. Um, but she was really on the front lines of reproductive technology. Um, and she was a really tenacious and methodical researcher. 
Um, so I chose to center her in the chapter that's on um, kind of the story of the egg cell and how we learned about its biology. I think I think I recall reading somewhere where they used to believe some, some that sperm actually had, you know, a, a bunch of little people in there. Yeah, that is kind of one of my favorite, like, absurd anecdotes about science, um, about sperm science. So that was called preformation. And I think the craziest part about it is it wasn't just like people were guessing this. It was actually the inventor of the microscope who was one of the people saying this. So Antony von Leeuwenhoek, um, he was looking at stuff with his microscope, um, brand new. He was very excited. He looked at like pond scum and earwax. And he finally looked at his own semen. Um, and he sent this letter to the Royal Society at the time that was like, listen, I looked at sperm, but don't worry. I didn't do it by sinfully defiling myself. It was with proper copulation with my wife. And you can burn this letter if you see fit, but just in case you don't, here's what I saw. And he describes all these little animacles, he calls them. Um, and later he argues that each one has in its head a tiny folded up human being, and it might be male or female. And that's what determines like whether a child is male or female. And this basically is like, an extension of the idea that the female body is the soil and the male provides the seed. So the female is just an incubator, but the male provides the essence of reproduction, which is just amazing to me to like make the argument that females aren't very involved in reproduction. Um, so yeah, um, he, he was a proponent of that. He eventually changed his mind and other factions came up that were um, arguing actually the egg uh, provides all the material for life and the sperm doesn't do much at all um, and it would take 200 more years i believe before we saw sperm and egg come together and realize that they were equal participants in the development of life really, really seems to me uh, an important lesson of the story that you tell is the importance of inclusion and in research um if you only have and this is between men and women. If you only have men doing the research, what will that mean for women? But I'm sure we could expand that out to include all kinds of people, different ethnicities, different part of the world, et cetera, et cetera. The importance of being more inclusive in who actually does this research. Oh, absolutely. And I just provide like a small sampling of that happening. Um, but there was a really wonderful, um, she's an HIV researcher. She's a nurse, PhD, um, woman of color. And she was writing about the vaginal microbiome and she was really the first person who wrote a paper to point out like, Hey, um, all these other papers are making it sound like women of color who have this type of vaginal microbiome are kind of like, it's like a racial thing. Like it has to do with their biology and nobody has made the connection that also there are social and cultural factors and that your biology is also a reflection of cultural factors. So if you have a life of having a lower income and not having access to the same medical care and dealing with stress of racism, like you're going to have a different looking microbiome. Um, so we need to, first of all, untangle those two things. Um, and second of all, not assume that things are racially or biologically grounded. And it was like such an important point that I really hadn't seen um, articulated anywhere else. And I think that she was the one to realize that. Um, one other thing is that interdisciplinary researchers make points that no one else has and make these connections. So she wasn't a microbiome researcher initially. And so she was able to come in as more of an outsider and see these bigger level things that other people had missed. What are the important questions today about the vagina that we either are or, or are not uh, researching i think we're starting to recognize some of these qualities of other reproductive organs like the ovaries and the uterus so i really came away with the impression that they were incredibly regenerative and dynamic and i mean they literally have all these stem cells and are making new cells and new lining in the case of the uterus and potentially even new eggs in the case of the human ovaries, which is brand new science. Um, so I think that's beginning to be appreciated and looked at. Um, for the vagina, I think there's a lot of really basics. Um, so one of the reasons that I ended up writing about animal vaginas in that chapter was because there was so much unanswered about the human vagina. So I was looking into these very straightforward questions like, 
how does the vagina shape like change with puberty and childbirth and after birth? And there's very little research on that. Um, and just like, what's the variety of shapes and sizes of human vaginas? Um, Cause that's something you can find out in the same way that Patty Brennan is doing with other species. And really there was almost nothing. Um, I found this retired anatomy teacher um, in Tennessee who had tried to do that research by making molds of the vagina. And she kind of said, hmm, I think there's five different shapes. Like I'm seeing a barely impressive variety, but she was never able to follow up on that research. She wasn't able to get funding. Her school wouldn't even print it in their newsletter. Like she was kind of laughed at. Um, so it never got off the ground. Because these are our shame parts. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I think that it's like, it's a minefield of questions to be asked, actually. Um, I mean, it's such a like literally resilient organ. The fact that it like can go back to the same size and shape after all it's been through. And the fact that it's lined with this army of bacteria that helps keep you healthy and keep you in balance. Um, that's definitely, I think, a new frontier. Rachel Gross has been our guest. Rachel Gross is, again, award-winning science journalist, and she has joined us for a conversation about her book, Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage. Rachel Gross, I have enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you dearly for taking this time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for the conversation and for your great questions. I really appreciate being here.